verse 7. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. I want to bring to you a message tonight entitled, Hooks Hurt. Hooks Hurt. Genesis 4, 7 says, You will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. Another translation says to, to, not to pummel, but to trample you. To, it's, it's a crouching position to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Tonight I want to talk to you on the subject, hooks hurt, and I want to let you in on a secret. They really hurt. Hooks hurt. Amen? Now, if you've ever went fishing before, chances are you've experienced this. Because whether it's your finger, your leg, sometime you catch the hook, unfortunately, right? Normally I rotate between trees and myself when I'm fishing. That's how that goes. Back when Scott was youth pastor in his infinite wisdom, he took us on a uh, youth camp out and somehow they had acquired all of these boats and canoes and they just let us partner up and go for it. Most everyone didn't have supervision. I, of course, did. Scott was next to me as always. And we paddled around and we fished. Well, I didn't catch anything all day, which is not out of the ordinary when I go casting. But Scott, I think, caught a couple. Chris was with us. Well, we came back before some of the other groups, and we're sitting there on the dock. And all of a sudden, John Eric comes up. And he's not here tonight. I wish he was. But he comes up, and he's got a, a, a different look on his face. John Eric's fishing partner was a boy by the name of Toby Feltz. Now, if you've been around here, you know that name. Toby grew up in this church, and uh, he still lives somewhere local, but uh, we, we're, we're reaching out to him. He's not here right now, but uh, Toby had caught the biggest fish of his life that morning. It happened to be John Eric. As they got closer, Toby still had his reel and rod. John Eric's paddling, and he's got a treble hook right about here. And so I was, gonna ho I was hoping John Eric would be here tonight so I could ask him to testify, but I want to promise you something that hooks hurt, right? If you've ever went fishing before, you understand that. Now, this is a spinnerbait, okay? This is one of my least favorite spinnerbaits, to tell you the truth. And I'm no good with any spinnerbait, more than likely. But here's how this thing works. This is a very effective bait. It's got this little device here that spins... And that does several things. It's a flash of color, so it gets attention. It makes a, a, a current or a ripple in the water as you reel. The faster you reel, the faster this spins, creating noise in the water. These, these, these here, they jangle, right? And, and so as this bait's going by, the fish can hear it, they can see it, and it creates movement inside of the water. And then on top of that, there's the beautiful skirt. And, and in the water, the, the skirt doesn't look so good out of the water, but when it goes into the water, it kind of comes alive and gets size. And so this is a very effective bait. And what makes it even more effective is that there's a hook underneath that thing, right? But isn't that just about how temptation works? Right? We see something and we like that bling, right? We got to have it because they've got it. We need it, kind of coveting and kind of envious. And then you ever notice that, that the right things don't normally grab you, but the wrong things do? It gets your attention, right? It's a flash. It makes a noise. It's a vibration. And before you know it, we like the color we like the bling. We enjoy the chase, right? As this thing goes by a bass and all of that happens, it pursues it and grabs hold of it. We, we, we do that with sin. We enjoy the chase. It's the rush, right? Sometimes we even like how that skirt shakes, right? But just like the bait, temptation, there's a hook underneath, right? Right? And tonight I want to remind us all that hooks hurt. Tonight I want to tell you something I'm experienced with. And I, it, it, it's this, how to stay off of the hook. Not necessarily because I've been great at practicing it in my life, although I haven't been hooked too many times like John Eric. But I'm pretty experienced in this area because the fish have taught me. 
I don't always catch fish, and I've learned some things from the fish, right? Fish are easy to find. People say all the time, well, we went fishing, but we couldn't find the fish. That's a lie. Fish are easy to find. They're in the water, right? You can take me to any pond, and I can point you to where the fish are. They're in the water. Lake, ocean, whatever, they're in the water, but what's difficult is to get them to bite, right? Jimmy's better at it than I am. He's been teaching me. So here's the question tonight. How do you stay off of the hook? I got two points for you. The first way is by feasting. You can hardly catch a full fish. It won't bite. Why won't it bite? Because it's satisfied. Because it's full. It doesn't need what you're offering. Right? But here's our problem that sin... And whether it was sin that we, we had before, sinful lifestyle we had before Christ or, or, or sin that we still continue to struggle with, and many times those are the same, but sin has created an appetite inside of us. And, and, and a lot of times it's a growing appetite if we're practicing it. We want more and more and more, right? And so rather than feasting on what we should be, it's when this thing goes by, we jump on it. Have you ever noticed how, 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 how downgraded your desire is whenever you're really hungry? You ever thought about what you would eat when you're starving compared to if you're not that hungry? I remember when, we were, when I was younger, me and my dad were at the deer lease one time, and we used to have a deer lease out in the Magnolia area, and great deer lease that had everything but deer. I'm telling you the truth. We loved that place, but we didn't kill much. Some of my greatest memories of growing up were out there. And one, one night we were leaving and I was starving. I said, Dad, we got to get something. I'm, I'm hungry. And there, that was before Magnolia blew up and, and it, there wasn't really anywhere to eat out there. So he gave me a can of Vienna sausage. Now, they weren't the ones like from behind the seat of the truck that he had brought. These were off the shelf at the camp house. I don't have any idea how old they were. But when we popped the lid, and he ate some too, the juice that's inside of them was like jelly on top. Y'all with me? I said, Dad, there's something wrong with mine. It's got jelly on top, and it's not grape flavored. It still kind of hurts my stomach to talk about it. I'm not currently that hungry to eat those right now, but in that moment I was. And if you leave me without food long enough, I, I might get back on that. Dad said, Dad said, it's just like jelly, son. Just eat it. And I did. And I wasn't hungry. The rest of the ride home, probably till the next day. But in that moment, my desire, my, my, my need, that temporary need was worth more than, than my normal choice, Right? The temporary desire, the temporary need outweighed my, my eating standards. Now, I, I, I'm not real picky as it is, but that was pushing it for me. Have you ever, one time we were going on, on a date, me and Rachel, and we were going to go out to eat somewhere nice, and we'd stopped to drop the kids off at, at my mom's house, and my mom was cooking grilled cheese for the kids. Well, I knew that we were about to go to like Sawgrass or somewhere real nice, but in that moment, I was hungry. Them grilled cheese look good, right? Just give me a half of one or two or three, right? It'll hold me over, but what happens is you don't enjoy what was better because you took what was a substitute. And we settle for this when we could be feasting on this. Are you with me tonight? How do we keep off the hook? How do we avoid that bait when it goes by? The best way we can do that is be so filled with what's right, what's better, that we don't, substitute, we don't fall for a substitute. Sin is just a substitute. The pleasure that sin gives is only a substitute for a greater pleasure that God gives. I'll never forget the testimony of, of Brother James George as he stood right here and he said, I've tried every drug known to man. And I was like, really? You have my attention. And he said, but what I feel right now is better than anything I've ever tried, any high that I've ever had. God it is so much greater. I'm telling you, young person, he said, don't even try something else. Because what I have right now is better than all that I've already tried. Amen? 
It's about feasting on what's better. It, it's about more good food and less junk food. Ephesians 5.15 says, so then be very careful how you live. Don't live like foolish people, but like wise people. Don't live foolish. Don't chase this thing. Make the most of your opportunities because these are evil days. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord wants. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to wild living. Instead, be filled, say be filled, with the Spirit by reciting psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs for your own good. Sing and, sing and make music to the Lord with your hearts. Be filled with the Spirit. And, and, and we, we've learned and we know that that, that actually translates to be ye being filled. That it's a continual, it's, it's what the Bible says that, that he will spring up like a, like a river of living water. I tell the kids, the, the teenagers when they're talking about the, the, the Holy Ghost coming inside of you and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and being filled with the Spirit, I say it's like someone turns on a water spigot right here. And it just keeps running and it just keeps running and it just keeps running. It's more than just a drink. It's a river that came to life. Be filled with the Spirit. How do I stay off the hook? Stay on Jesus. If you're so filled with what's better, you won't fall for what's fake, what's substitute. We sang a song on Sunday, trading all that I've had for all that is better. We gotta learn to feast. Philippians 4, 8 and 9, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the peace of God, sorry, then the God of peace will be with you. Fill your heart, fill your spirit, be filled with the spirit and fill your mind with things that are right. Where does sin start? Right here. Paul says, be filled. Think, think on these things. Consume your mind with what's better so that you won't be chasing bait. It's about feasting on what's right. These verses teach us to fill ourselves with the things of the Lord. How can you stand against temptation? By staying full of Jesus. But what can happen in the moment is our impulse and our desire will lower our values so that we can satisfy ourselves in the moment. It's like a reaction, right? Right? I see the bait, I want the bait, I take the bait. It's a reaction. But in that moment, if we are filled with Christ, then we will see this go by and say, you know what? I think I'll pass. I think I'll pass. How many times do we let the sparkle cause us to forget about the hook? Huh? We can't let the satisfaction of that moment cause us to forget about the hook. Because here's what... Here's what bothers me about my own life, is we already know the cost. We already know the price. It's not that the enemy's changing baits on us most of the time. We just keep seeing the same one go by, and for whatever reason, in the moment, the bait looks better than the price of the hook, than the cost. Right? Are you, are you with me? We've been there before, we know the price, we know the cost, and we know our appetite, and we know how it's going to end, but we're just so hungry. Church, we need to live with our eyes on eternity, so that every decision that we make is marked by eternity, the long-term value versus the short-term value. It, it, it's easy to talk about, but man, it's hard. It's hard. We've got to... to, to Change, we can change many of our choices by simply considering their outcome. I think of two mighty warriors in the Bible, one named David and one named Samson. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And if you study the life of David, he responded to situation after situation by following God. Lifelong choices. Eternal value in his choices. Was he a perfect man? Absolutely not. But he was a man after God's own heart. And the, 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 the focus of his life was the Lord. And he allowed his decisions to reflect the Lord and to be God-centered. Samson was a mighty warrior. Strong, powerful. Judging by what we read about him, I'm not sure how smart he was. But David had a, a, a long legacy. One of the greatest men the Bible has ever written about. But Samson's story is much shorter. Why? 
Because he had a bait that he couldn't quit biting. And then Delilah went by. He saw the bait. He wanted the bait. And he took the bait. The Bible says that, that, that God had created Samson to, to wreak havoc on the Philistines. God had a, a huge plan for Samson. But he let his choices be temporary rather than eternal. What he wanted in the moment versus what God had created him for his whole life long. Here's the point. We've got no reason to be hungry. We don't. We talked Sunday that the, that the Lord is at the door knocking. That he said that he would come in and dine with us. And that, that translation, that the, 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 the picture there, the illustration is that I will come in and feed you. That I will come in and I will nourish you myself. We have no reason to be hungry. We just choose not to be at the table. And then whenever the bait comes by, we chase after it. And we get hooked. And hooks hurt. Right, John Eric? John Eric said amen. We can pass on the artificial, the substitute, the bait, because we feasted on what is better. Yes? Yes? So how do I stay off a hook? By feasting. Right? If I eat enough meat and veggies, I'm not going to want have room for the ice cream. Right? That's my philosophy. It's not a real good one because I eat way too much meat and veggies. And I justify it by passing on the ice cream and then I end up eating the ice cream. Right? It's that bait. So the first part is feasting. The second part, what if that doesn't work, is fasting. Two opposites, two extremes, two, two exact opposites, but both of them have the same reaction or response in our lives to conviction, I'm sorry, to temptation. Fasting kills flesh. It's like a super combat against temptation. Whenever feasting is not doing the trick for me, I try fasting. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? The enemy came to him in that moment. Jesus had fasted for 40 days. And, and on the outside, this is what the enemy's seeing. He's been without food for 40 days. I've got him now. Now he's weak. Now he's desperate. Now he's empty. And he's alone. But in reality, when the enemy came to Jesus, he was filled with the Spirit. He wasn't empty. He was ready. He was prepared. He was free in that moment. He, he was closer to God. He was full. Fasting can make that thing that we're struggling with shrivel up and die. Because it kills flesh. It's like tempting a vegan with a steak. Right? I don't understand the vegan lifestyle, but I know many people have gone all into it. And if you offer them a steak right now, they won't even take it. They won't, it won't even be a temptation to them because their lifestyle has changed so dramatically that that's no longer even a desire. Are you with me? The same can happen inside of us if we pay the price, if we will actually get to that point that, that, that we can actually cut that thing off. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable that for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, now we understand this is not a, a physical implication, but it's a spiritual one. God's not saying gouge out your eye. God is saying change your eye to where the part that is lustful dies. It's an extreme response, and this is, what, this is what it's actually saying. Take out the root of the problem and starve that thing to death. It's killing the will to no longer allow the eye to be used lustfully, but only for the purpose it was created. Okay, it's, it's the idea that if you keep grabbing for something, okay, you're not supposed to grab this thing and you keep grabbing it and you keep grabbing it and you say, okay, don't grab that anymore, don't grab that anymore, but you keep grabbing it and you keep grabbing it, you can put something else in the hand and it might prevent them from grabbing it, but eventually they might drop that and still grab it, but if you cut their hand off, they're not gonna grab it, right? It's, it's taking away the opportunity 
before there's the temptation. Are you, are you following me? It, it's not just addressing the sin, but the underlying issue that's causing the sin. It's like this, it's, it's the idea that every time I drive down this particular road, I end up in the ditch at this one spot. So I've gone down the road and I've tried to go fast through that spot and I still ended up in the ditch. And then I tried to go slower and I still ended up in the ditch. So I tried to hug the left side, but I still slid over into the ditch. So I tried the middle and I still slid over. I tried the right side, but I still slid over. So what I've decided is I'm just not going to go down that road anymore. I know that when I get to that particular point that I'm not going to be good enough to, to get through there. I'm not going to be strong enough that I'm going to continue to fail or to fall in that moment. So rather than even going down that street and giving it my best effort, I'm just going to cut that street out of my path. Amen. That's what this is saying. If your eye is causing you to sin, then, then get away from whatever's causing you to sin. It's an extreme response. It's a, 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 an extreme action to prevent the temptation. It's completely separating ourselves from the opportunity before another temptation comes along. Going beyond the response and addressing the root. Feasting is, is valuable, but fasting takes it out. It's a complete change in lifestyle. It's looking at the rating before you go to the movie because you're not sure if you can look away at that particular scene. It's saying, I know that group right there are gossiping, right? Right? And we all do the same thing when we get there. What are you talking about? What did you say? What are you talking about? And then when it's about you, they don't say anything? <laughs> You've been there. Me too. But it's saying, I don't need to go right there. I don't need to go right there. It's fasting and saying, God, I'm almost embarrassed to keep asking you to forgive me of this, so show me what the root is. And, and maybe I'm going to fast from food so that God will change my desire for that particular thing. God, I want my lifestyle to change. I want this habit to no longer define me, no longer plague me. I, I, I don't want to deal with this any longer. And you know what happens when we fast? In reality, we're feasting. As we're cutting off, as it's what John said, let there be less of me and more of him. I must decrease so that he might increase. John said, I, I must become less and less so that he could become more and more. So one's giving and one's taking. As we're fasting, we're, we're forcing ourselves to be less and less. And as we become less, automatically God's becoming more. So these really aren't two separate things, but they happen simultaneously at times. As we fast, we begin to feast. You ever notice after fasting how, how easy it is to stand against temptation? Why? Because you're full. You might jump all over those Vienna sausage, but that temptation is not near what it was. But when you're full, when you've been feasting, then things aren't the same. You're, you're not as susceptible to them. You know, I think about the, the, the prodigal son. What did he leave? And he got so far from the father's house that he was looking at the pig slop. And he's thinking, you know what? She scoots over a little bit. I can get right there next to her. Sister, oink, oink. That's what one pastor said. And Brother Piggly Wiggly, if they'll let me in, I'm going to lay down right next to him and start eating. Why? Because was that the way he ate at his father's house? No. They had fatted calf, steak, and all kinds of good stuff, right? But he had gotten so empty that he would even jump on the pig scraps. Church, we've got we've to be filled 
and at the, filled and emptied at the same time. Filled with the Spirit and dying to the flesh. How do we stay off the hook? Kill that thing that desires it and feed what will stand against it. Feed the Spirit, kill the flesh. It's tough. It's tough. Won't you bow your head with me tonight? Let's pray for a moment. we were to be real honest, that, that, that one scripture's true for all of us. It says, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily entangles us. It's like I said a while ago that the enemy doesn't have to even change baits. He just throws the same one. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily entangles us. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Tonight, we're all in this together on this pursuit of, of righteousness and godliness, this pursuit of holiness, this process of sanctification. There are things in your life that you're not battling today that you were six months ago or a year ago because God's delivered you from those. But there are other issues in your life, in my life, and all of our life that are just right on the forefront of our battle. And we are contending and fighting for victory in those things. Sometimes we find ourselves passing on the bait and other times we find ourselves on the bait. I told a young man in my office the other day, I said, God called us to be fishers of men and son, you keep ending up on the wrong end of the pole. I'm right there with him. All of us are. I'm not saying that we're gonna be perfect but I'm saying that we're still contending for a greater level of holiness. And so tonight, what is it that's been coming by your house? What's that bait that's been swimming across your face? Don't give up. Don't give up. But let's change our mind tonight. Trading all that I've had for all that is better. Less of me and more of you, God. Feasting on your presence so that I won't fall when that thing comes by my nose again. And if that doesn't work, then extreme times call for extreme measures. <laughs> 